Let's look at another obscure or underappreciated weapon known as the Kinjal or Kama. Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorial. Now this weapon is uh, not that obscure, in fairness. Um, some of you may never have heard of this, or indeed some of you may have heard of it by different names. And that's where one of the confusions lies with this weapon. So many people will look at this and immediately think that it is perhaps a Cossack dagger, perhaps a Russian dagger, perhaps a Persian dagger. And the, they might even know that it's a Georgian or Caucasian, as in from the Caucasus, Caucasus uh, um, dagger. And in fact, all of those people would be kind of right. Uh, so this is a type of dagger which in fact goes all the way back, um, in theory at least, to the late Roman period, or arguably even actually um, before the Roman era, if you go back uh, in its ancestors all the way to the Bronze Age. Um, and that's where one of the problems lies, is that when we're talking about weapons which have stayed along, uh, stayed the same design or the same kind of shape for a long time, very often you find sweeping statements made about their um, origins and history. And in fact, the origins and history of this is a little bit obscure, um, but it does seem to me that it, it has um, its origins in some degree in Persia, if not totally in its design, certainly in terms of the terminology applied to it. In other words, the names uh, used to describe it. Now, this particular dagger that you can see here, you can find daggers that look exactly or very, very similar to this um, from a broad range of areas, including Persia, that's modern day Iran, even parts of Turkey, um, all, all the way across to Georgia, the Caucasus, uh, Russia, Ukraine, um, so a broad sweeping area um, and that seems to be due to a variety of uh, migration of some degree to some degree people but also styles, uh, fashion, technological um, advancement and so on and so forth. But fundamentally most examples of this type of dagger are usually either uh, from the Caucasus or Georgia or they're from Persia. Now, um, the differences are partly, between those two uh, types, are partly to do with the details. The overall shape of this type of a dagger, and I'll talk a bit more about uh, the details of its construction in a minute, but the overall shape of this, you can find Persian examples, but equally you can find examples in Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, and Caucasus. So, um, and they're not terribly different. So the way that they differ in details are in terms of the precise type of blade, in other words, the cross section and the details of the edges and any fullering or detailing on here. Sometimes in terms of decoration, if there's inlaid um, or uh, etched or engraved decoration on the blade. Um, sometimes in the construction and material of the grips and the precise detailing of the shaping of the grips, although the overall shape is usually like this. And also, you'll notice it has these decorative rivets that are actually real rivets as well. They actually attach the grips onto the tang. And I'll talk more about the construction in a second. Um, the details of the ends of these rivets can vary as well. And you'll find that on Persian examples, you'll find details that you don't necessarily find on examples from uh, Georgia um, or Ukraine, for example. Um, so there are differences, but overall, this is a type of dagger which has been around for a very, very long time let's say 2,000 years, um, although it has varied a bit in that time. Um, uh, it's been around for a long, long time. It's still, I think, being produced today, although these were particularly popular right the way up to the 19th century, in fact, even about World War I, um, so the early 20th century. And um, they are uh, very iconic um, in several different areas. And they also have quite a big cultural uh, impact as well. For example, Alexander Pushkin, uh, Russian poet, um, actually like celebrates this type of dagger. Um, and, and in fact, they're much beloved in, in uh, Persia, in Iran as well. So they ha seem to be very fondly held by the cultures that use them, probably partly because they've been around for a very, very long time. So you'll notice that I refer to uh, these daggers and uh, the, the names of these things uh, is sort of problematic. Basically because, because they span across a large area, different language groups, different religious uh, regions, they actually go by several different names. Um, so I, uh, traditionally I have known these primarily as 
um, Kanjar. Now the name Kanjar or Kanjali actually comes from a Persian origin. So they are, I believe, predominantly known as uh, Kanjali in Georgia, for example, but that is essentially a Persian word. Now what's interesting is the Persian Empire uh, was incredibly influential in, in many parts of um, uh, Eastern Europe, but also even in India and obviously Afghanistan. Um, so there are many words that come from Farsi or Persian that passed into other languages. And this is an example, uh, the Kanjal Kanjali. And you'll notice anyone who's read uh, Herbert's Dune uh, books, incidentally, the Kanjar is a word that's adopted there for the type of daggers that they use. Uh, although the description of a Kanjar in the Dune books doesn't really match these, it actually matches something more similar to what a Kanjar would be in India. Um, in other words, it's curved. Um, but the word Kanjar actually really just means dagger, okay, in Farsi. And this word Kanjar is used in uh, for Indian daggers, which are of a different design to this. But equally, Kanjali is uh, a word that I believe is used uh, in Georgia and um, and elsewhere as well. So it just means dagger, but it's the fact that they've used a Persian word implies that this has a Persian origin. Now, ironically, the Persian version of these are usually known as Kama or Kwama. Uh, it's a, spelt with a Q usually, can sometimes be spelt in other areas with a K. Obviously, when we're rendering from Farsi into English, it's um, you do it by sound, you do it phonetically, so how we spell it in English is partly irrelevant, uh, but usually this is called Kama, we would call it. So usually in Persia, this is known by a different name. So it's sort of ironic that in areas outside Persia where they adopted this type of dagger, whether they had it first or not, uh, I don't know, I couldn't tell you. But I think that the implication is that the fact that they used the Persian word for dagger probably means that in those areas, this was known as the Persian dagger and they adopted it and they used the Persian word for dagger, which was Kanjal, Kanjali and they adopted that in those regions. So despite the fact that these were famously sometimes carried by Cossacks, for example, uh, and these are famously worn and carried in the Caucasus and in Georgia, they are probably of Persian origin. Now that might interest some of you because many of you think of Persian daggers and swords as being curved quite often, but you have to bear in mind that the period when these came from, we're going back uh, best part of 2000 years or uh, very, very least 1500 years, actually in that period the Persians were using lots of straight double-edged blades. So this kind of does fit in that context. Now some of you will be thinking, Matt, it looks like a gladius or a pugio. Indeed, it does, and it's entirely possible that these have some connection, if we go back 2,000 years, these have some connection to Roman swords and daggers. Conversely, you could say the other way around, without being culturally, preferen culturally preferential. It could be that the, the Roman, you know, the Gladius Hispiensis, or more, more precisely the Pugio, actually, is probably influenced by things which had a common ancestor to the Persian Kama. So a very, very interesting weapon still being produced in large numbers up until World War I, I think still being produced today and worn culturally uh, in Georgia, for example. Uh, anyone who's watching incidentally in Georgia, maybe you're in Ukraine or Russia, I'd be very interested to hear your views about these and how you view the origin of these and how they're viewed today. Um, I know that there's a lot of cultural fondness for these. Now, um, finally, I'll just talk about the particular construction of this example and how this relates to, to other antique examples we'll find. So one of the very, very interesting things, in fact, there's a few interesting things about this dagger, is that it has a full width tang, okay? So I'm gripping the blade here, I'll clean it and oil it afterwards, so don't, don't fret over that, but usually don't handle blades unless you're prepared to clean them straight afterwards. The tang is the sh same shape as the grip, which leads to a very, very strong construction. It's similar to how some uh, Roman daggers are constructed, incidentally, and it's similar to how um, a lot of kitchen knives are produced or some uh, Bowie knives, for example. So very, very strong tang because the tang is the full width of the blade here and then is supported by the grip material uh, for the thinner parts of it. So very, very strong construction, firstly. So that's the first very interesting thing about the construction of these. The second thing is that these double-edged blades often feature um, offset fullers, particularly in the um, Eastern European um, Georgian and, and um, Caucasus examples, whereby you'll notice the fuller here is nearer to the what would appear to you to be the bottom edge. If I flip that over, 
the fuller here is nearer to the bottom edge. So in fact, if you look here, the fuller is near the top on this side and near the bottom of this side. So this means the fullers or grooves, blood grooves, as some people would call them, the grooves come in like this on each side of the blade. They don't come in in the center as would be the case on most conventional double-edged blades. This is very interesting. This is actually emulated in certain French swords, incidentally, and was I believe they called it as the cannula uh, design, whereby you can have very deep fullers that are offset against each other, and therefore they, you, you can have them deeper than they would be if they were coming in the middle where they would meet, which obviously you wouldn't want because it would go right the way through the blade. So a very interesting blade design. The final thing is the grip materials, and the grip materials can be made of various uh, types of uh, material, but in this particular case, it is horn, dark horn on the back, which worn against the side would be the non-visible side, and on the front is actually made of walrus ivory, that is tooth, okay, so ivory in elephants is a sort of tooth material, tooth-like material, it is den dentine I think, um, and this is particularly walrus ivory which you can recognize from the fact that it has this kind of crazed crackling look to it, and that is particularly walrus ivory, which obviously is a controlled substance in modern law, certainly in the UK and most countries, um, so you have to be careful about selling this and shipping it and things like that, it comes under the same rules, CITES, as uh, elephant ivory. Um, but nevertheless, walrus ivory was highly valued, and what's, what's very, very interesting actually is that in some cases we think of elephant ivory as being the most exotic and the most desirable type of ivory in a, in a kind of antique sense, um, maybe in a 19th century sense, but actually walrus ivory was very highly valued because of course it was more exotic to people, for example, in Iran, in Persia, uh, because they don't have walruses. <laughs> so whereas... Um, Someone in America or Britain might really desire elephant ivory as exotic and difficult to obtain. In, in Persia, walrus ivory would be the really exotic and unusual and difficult to obtain thing. Same thing in India, of course. So uh, this was very exotic and very desirable in some places. And there was a trade in ivory, obviously elephant ivory from Africa and India and, and up Thailand and other places to places that didn't have elephants and trading of walrus ivory to places that didn't have walruses. Um, so very, very interesting. The final thing I would say is about the scabbards. I don't have the scabbard for this, but the scabbards tend to follow the shape of the blade and they usually have a ball um, finial on the end. And the scabbards can be extremely ornate. Uh, given that this is walrus ivory, although it is simple iron fittings, I suspect this didn't have a particularly uh, ornate um, scabbard, but it may have been uh, coat, it may have been covered in silver plates or silver decoration, and probably non-precious stones. Um, and that might be why the scabbard hasn't survived with this knife, because it's completely possible that the scabbard, if it was silver, might be melted down and sold for its silver value. And then this poor old um, uh, kama or, or kanjar, kanjali, whatever you want to call it, was left without a scabbard. Um, that's one possibility. But in any case, this doesn't have the scabbard, which is a shame, but just so you know that these do normally have ornate scabbards with them, and very often the style and decoration of the scabbard will match the uh, decoration on the hilt um, of the dagger itself. So there we go. I hope that's been interesting. As I say, if you're from an area where these are well known to you, I'd be fascinated to hear more anecdotes and information about them. But to a lot of people in the world, they actually wouldn't know what this was or where it was from. So hopefully a few more of you now know what this is. Thanks for watching and I'll see you really soon again on the channel for another video. Cheers folks!